say about the purpose of kingdom authority. The purpose of kingdom authority. We talked last week a lot about the kingdom and uh, and about the um, you know, about the apostolic and about the fivefold and about New Testament church and about about how the apostolic grace flows uh, in a kingdom context and so on. But today I want to uh, talk about the purpose of kingdom authority and um, the word authority in the in the Bible means. Uh, or in the New Testament, it means to have control over. Alright, so to have control over something, it means to have and to wield full privilege over something. Alright, so in other words, um, to have authority is a privilege, but then it's about how we exercise that authority so that the privilege of having that authority actually produces its outcomes. Alright, so that's what authority, authority is in the New Testament. Um, Matthew 7, verses 28 to 29. Matthew 7, 28 to 29. It says, It came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. This is a really interesting thing that the people were saying. They were astonished at Jesus' teaching. But the reason for their astonishment wasn't because he, um, um, it was just a, the latest fad or something. And it wasn't because he had, uh, was exhibiting more knowledge than the scribes, all right? The, the reason that they were astonished was because of the authority that they observed um, as he taught. And, um, and here's the thing, that in Matthew 13, 52, Matthew chapter 13, 52, um, Jesus said, every scribe who is instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like a man that is a, a householder who brings forth out of his treasure things new and old. And so Jesus is talking about scribes and the kingdom here, and, uh, and yet in, the, in Matthew 7, the people are contrasting Jesus with scribes. Jesus contrasts the kingdom with scribes. And so the, the, the scribes, of course, were those who, who copied the Bible, you know, the Old Testament, and, and produced copies of it. But more than that, the scribes were like the, uh, the secretaries. They were the, uh, they were the writers, they were the recorders, of, of, uh, of history as well as copying the, you know, making copies of the Old Testament and so on. And because they were uh, always writing, they were always learning, they were always growing in knowledge, the scribes were the, the learned ones of Israel. And so these guys had a lot of knowledge. So what we're seeing here in these two scriptures is that the people compared Jesus with the most knowledgeable people, and particularly the most knowledgeable religious people. All right? and, and the people said, the difference between the, our most knowledgeable religious people and this man we're listening to is that this man has authority. The others have knowledge, but this man has authority. So knowledge does not necessarily equate to authority. There is a difference. And, um, and if authority means to... to um, have and wield full privilege over there. It's the, the privilege of having revelation from God and, and actually then uh, expressing that in ways that actually produce kingdom outcomes. Yeah? And then, um, then of course, when Jesus talked about scribes and co compared or contrasted or, or uh, mentioned them in conjunction with the kingdom, he was actually saying, everyone who, who um, has great religious knowledge, all right, and also wants to be a pupil of the kingdom. So the, that's the context here. That he's talking about people who have the great religious knowledge, but who then decide that they want to become a pupil of the kingdom of God. And then he says these people must be like a household who brings out things new and old. In other words, there's a foundation in their knowledge, a foundation in the word of God, a foundation of understanding God's overall purposes for his people. There's a foundation of their, their actual, um, uh, not only knowledge of the, the Old Testament, but it was also that they learned the five, first five books off by heart as children. And so some of these guys, because they were writing it all the time, they actually came to the place where they memorized most of the Old Testament. And so this stuff was ingrained into them. And Jesus is saying, that the scribes, if they want to become a pupil of the kingdom, which, which I think is the only way to, to actually enter into the, the authority that God's got for us, is to become a pupil all over again. <laughs> Do you know, I've got to say that um, 
Uh, the further I go on this journey, uh, the more I realise how little I really know. <laughs> and the more I realise how much I was taught that actually isn't very helpful. <laughs> because this is a new season in God, you know? And so, if we are going, no matter what we've known, if we're going to have authority in what we say, and if we're going to have, have kingdom authority in what we do, then yes, there's some things that we've learned that are important as foundational things for the future, but there is also a whole lot of new things we must enter into because this next season uh, that we're in is uh, not just all new, but some of the things from the past are, are, are always going to be relevant, and some of the things from the past must be taken into the new season, but we've got to know which to leave behind and which to take forward. And I think that de depending on how we become like a householder, you know, you know what a householder does. A householder, um, you know, depends on who comes to stay at the house or to visit, determines what is brought out when you're being hospitable. True? All right? So we have certain things in our house that are very um, uh, meaningful to us and some of them are, are gifts from people that we really appreciate. Uh, some of them are expensive things that we've bought or been given to us. So there are certain people who come to our house and um, they, those things are brought out. Yeah? Now, my wife Judy had two children before I met, I met her. The first time I went to her house for dinner, I could see the interesting looks on her daughter and son's faces because she was bringing out all the best stuff. So her children knew that this was something special that this man had come for dinner because of all the, the best things she brought out. And that's what we do, don't we? We bring, thing, bring out new things or special things in order to honour people. And so if we're going to honour God in a, in a, in a new season, then, then it's, it's not just about um, bringing all the religious knowledge we have from over all the years or the decades and, and just keeping on churning over all that old stuff. You see, if God's changed the season and if we're going to have authority in the new season, then we can't just be filled with knowledge. We have to actually understand that some of that is for the, for the new season, but there's fresh revelation as well. And we put the two together, the old and the new, and we can actually then function with authority in the new season. Does that make sense? Yeah. Amen. All right. So um, I don't ever want to have people say, oh, Phil, you know so much. <laughs> because... Then all I am is a scribe, <laughs> a man with religious knowledge. But I want to tell you something, if, if the day comes where people say, oh, man, you know, I, I know so many people who just know the word inside out, they have such deep knowledge and da 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 da, but the difference is you, you teach with authority, I mean, that's when we know that we're functioning, you know, the, where we should be in the kingdom. But also then we know that what, when Jesus said that he would give us authority, we know that we actually have it. And because it's his authority that's going to produce kingdom outcomes. Amen? It's not just the fact that we speak words. It's not just the fact that we have knowledge. Right? It's the authority that makes the difference. So, what is the purpose of kingdom authority? The purpose of kingdom, of kingdom authority is dominion. Kingdom authority is given to us so that ultimately we can have dominion. And um, so, in the, in the New Testament, the word for dominion means to be supreme. And, what, and because we're supreme, to then be able to push down or keep down other things. Alright? It means to, to lord against things. It means to control and to subjugate. Alright, so... So to, to have dominion means that we, we actually exercise the authority that we're given to deal with things that must be subjugated under the authority of the king. And therefore we have dominion when we subjugate things to his authority. So another verse, um, Matthew 21, 23. Matthew chapter 21, verse 23, it says, When Jesus was coming to the temple... The chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, 
By what authority do you do these things? And who gave you the authority? <laughs> That's a fair question, isn't it? <laughs> do you know, when I was, um, when I was a young preacher, um, I was very keen to get my ordination in the, uh, in the denomination I was in, in at that time. Because there was a, a prevailing thought, I suppose, that you, you actually had credibility and authority when you had your ordination and you had the certificate on the wall and the piece of plastic that you could show people. You know? Do you know what I found with that piece of plastic, you know, like the, the ordination card? The only thing it did was it got me in a better parking place when I went to do hospital visitation or, or jail visits. Because <laughs> back in those days they had special parking spots for ministers. And so you'd come to the security gate, put your hand out the window with your, your credential, you know, and they would say, oh, okay, so you're here to visit someone, you're a minister, said, yes. So, okay, your park, park, car parking area is down there. So special car parking privileges because you have a piece of plastic that says you're a minister of such and such a denomination. <laughs> Do you know, there were, when, when, I, when I left that denomination, there were a number of years where I did not have a you know, man's ordination. Interestingly, I still had a ministry. Still had spiritual authority. Yeah. Still had power in the Holy Ghost. Because you know what? If God doesn't ordain us, nothing man does is going to give us those things. True? Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and I'm, not, I'm not, please understand me, I'm not, um, I'm not being negative or, you know, ridiculing denominational things. I'm trying to get us to have a kingdom perspective. We're all belonging, we're, we're all involved in different denominations, you know. We all have to belong somewhere. And in today's world, the laws of our land say we've got to be registered. Our churches need to be, you know, part of a, a denomination, and, and we need to be uh, acknowledged as ministers, you know. Um, and, and we need to obey the law of the land. So I'm, I'm not saying we should throw all that out. I'm trying to help us to understand that there are things that are part of our thinking which we we accept as well. This is how it is. But you know, they never had credentials in the New Testament. They never had a ministry certificate on the wall from a denomination. Firstly, there was no denomination. Secondly, it was relational, not organisational. And so, a young man like Timothy, for instance, his credentials came from the Apostle Paul, who would say, I'm sending you, Timothy, like he did to the Philippian church in Philippians 2, around about verse 20. He says, I'm sending you, Timothy, because I have no one else who is like-minded. So that was his credentials. When Timothy turned up, he didn't say, oh, here's my, you know, <laughs> And here's my letters of recommendation, and here's all the great men of God who are, you can ring them up and they'll tell, tell you good things about me. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, we don't commend ourselves. You know, we don't compare ourselves. We don't, all this stuff. Why? Because spiritual authority doesn't come from man. It comes from God. Yes, amen. And it comes through covenant relationship with people that God puts us with. And what we see here is the same thing. And, uh, and so, um, the authority we have, uh, by what authority do you do these things? Well, I don't think any of us have done um, kingdom things in the name of our denomination. Because we know that the authority to produce kingdom outcomes doesn't come from men or from men's organisations. It comes from God. And that's why the people were confused, because Jesus didn't fit into the religious box of his day. Uh, and he was outside the religious system of his day. But they saw the authority on his life. And even the Pharisees who had the authority of the Judaistic you know, religion and the temple and, and all of that, even the Pharisees were saying, well, they didn't say, you don't have authority. They recognized the authority he had because they said, by whose authority do you do this? In other words, even the Pharisees, not just the people that stand at the authority on his teaching, but the Pharisees were so impacted by the authority on his life and his teaching and his ministry, his supernatural ministry, that they said, where did you get this authority? Do you know why? Because the authority on Jesus was so different from their authority. See, a, um, a religious spirit will never give us kingdom authority. It will give us religious authority, but it won't give us Holy Spirit authority. It won't give us kingdom authority. And, uh, and so then he said, and who gave you this? Well, of course, that's important. <laughs> 
What kind of authority is this? And then where did you get it? That were the two questions. I really believe God wants to bring his people back to a place where the, where the average person asks these kind of questions. See, this thing about the kingdom is not just, it's not just the, the latest fad. It's not just a thing that will come and go. God's restoring the kingdom context to his church and to how we minister because this, the kingdom context was what the early church had. And so he's actually restoring what the early church was about and what the context of the early church was and the message and the function. And so the thing is that the, the outcomes we're talking about here and the things that people might see in us and say and whatever, we need to believe for these things because if we truly have the kingdom in us and if we preach the message of the kingdom, then there should be kingdom outcomes and we should carry an authority that people can't um, deny and that they can't avoid and that they can't just ignore or be indifferent to. Yeah? And so, so then we, we need to come to this place, and I believe it's coming one day, where there's going to be people who are going to say, man, you know, we've heard preachers, but man, there's something on your life. What is it? You know? Where people in the world even are going to say, yeah, look, we, we understand spirituality. We're into this and that and whatever else, but, but, you know, the way you're talking, what is it? Where does that come from? Which is what these guys said. They said, well, by what authority are you doing it? And then where did you get this authority? You see, because authority is not um, a nebulous thing. Authority is something that is given. It comes from a source. All right? And, and the only source for kingdom authority is the king himself. The only source for spiritual authority in the kingdom of God is the spirit of God himself. Amen? All right. So then I want to add an extra question. So I think there's three questions we must be able to answer if we're going to um, truly exercise kingdom authority. Firstly, it is what authority do I have? That's the first question. What authority do I have? The second question is, who gave me this authority? So what authority do I have? Who gave me this authority? But then thirdly, how do I exercise this authority? How do I exercise it? So what is my authority? Who gives it to me? And how do I function in it? How do I exercise it? Alright, so the first thing I want to talk about is what authority do I have? Firstly, we have authority in the natural world. And man was always created to have authority in the natural world. Um, Genesis 1, verses 26 to 28. And I'm sure that we're all pretty familiar with these verses. But I'm going to read them to you. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and the very next thing after him saying, we're going to make man in our image and likeness, the very next thing he says, let them have dominion. You see, God establishes his purpose for the human race straight away. His purpose is not just for us to have a nice lifestyle. His purpose is not for us to, to um, you know, just have money or to have the things of this world and have pleasures or whatever. The purpose of the human race is to have dominion on this planet. And then he says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God's saying, I am creating man and woman and their first pur purpose and their primary purpose is to rule the planet, to have dominion, and so therefore he has to give us authority in order to produce, to, for us to be able to do that. Yeah? And so Adam and Eve actually were given authority to rule the planet. He put them in a garden, and they mismanaged the garden. <laughs> I think if they had continued to manage the garden well, they would have managed the planet. Them and their descendants. Yeah? But as it was, they mismanaged in the garden, and what ended up was that we now, you know, well, well for, for centuries, um, you know, humanity went through all kinds of ups and downs, and God spoke through his prophets, and God um, gave them judges and so on, and, and kings to try and help them to keep focused and to, to know God's ways. Um, but ever since the, the, the Garden of Eden, we've struggled with our authority on this planet, and we haven't really had dominion. 
You know, the reason we've had the conservation movement for the last few decades is because we've mismanaged the planet. Now, I don't agree with their agenda because it's, you know, it's not a kingdom agenda, but the fact is that because of sin in the world and because of man's greed and man's self-centeredness and you know, selfish desires and wanting to do just what suits us, then we've, we've ended up realising that there's some problems that have come out of that and we haven't had dominion. The only way we can have dominion fully in the planet is under the, the, uh, the direction of the king of the kingdom, under the direction of the creator of the planet. And I believe God's restoring the kingdom understanding because he actually wants us to rule and reign on this, on this globe called earth. And he wants us to actually have his way of doing things, not the conservationist way of doing things, not the political party's ways of doing things, not the, the, you know, the IMF and the UN and all the other you know, multi, um, you know, the global organisations, not their way of doing things. I believe that the day is going to come when the church is going to uh, have understanding and insight and revelation from God about how to have dominion in the natural world that will amaze all of these people who are putting billions into trying to save the planet. Now, I'm not saying we're going to run those organisations or any of those things. I'm saying that there is influence that you can have by being a nobody. Because mm. that's what authority does. See, Jesus was just born as a baby in Bethlehem to a carpenter from Nazareth. In, in the big scheme of things in, in Israel, he was nobody. Except he had the authority of his father. So when he opened his mouth, even the Pharisees had to take notice. Mm. Yep. All right? That's influence that comes from authority. Yeah. You don't have to have a position to have influence on the basis of spiritual authority. In fact, the best way to, to access this authority and influence is by walking humbly before God and man. Because if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, He will exalt us in due time. Amen. Yep. Have a heart to serve God and man. Have a passion to say, God, I'm nothing, I'm nobody without you. I want to be just clay in the potter's hand. And you know, the more we... Um, in fact, somebody said to me on Sunday that during the service, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and said, I want it to be less of you and more of me. Amen. And this person said, you know, we, we've said that for years. He said, but today it was a revelation to me. I said, well, you've just, you just come through a portal <laughs> because there is only one way to access the things of the kingdom, and that is through less of me and more of him. Laying ourselves down, hum uh, humbling ourselves, uh, becoming a servant. All the things in Philippians 2, you know, uh, had this mindset that Jesus had, who made himself of no reputation, humbled himself, came as a servant, was obedient to the point of death. Is, is this what the Christian message is? Absolutely. Jesus said, take up your cross daily. What's that? We've got to be obedient to the point of death. You know? But when, we, when it's all about Him and not about us, when it's less of me and more of Him, we come through a portal into a kingdom authority. We come through a portal into a kingdom revelation. We come through a portal into a whole new perspective about the purposes of God. And so, uh, getting back to what I'm saying, um, we have authority in the natural world. Verse 20 uh, goes on in Genesis 1. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, and God blessed them and said to them. Now, here's the blessing. Right? God blessed them and said to them. It's not two separate things. When God blessed them, he spoke the blessing over them. So this is the blessing for God's creation or for God's human creation. The blessing is be fruitful. Multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, have dominion. That's the blessing. You know, we've been kind of taught that blessing is um, you know, wonderful meetings and good feelings and, you know, like, oh, I feel the presence of God and, and um, you know, having, having plenty of money and, and uh, having a good life and, and I'm blessed. That's not what God, the Bible says blessing is. In Genesis 1, when God spoke blessing over the humans He created, Adam and Eve, the blessing was, be fruitful. Yeah. Multiply yourselves. Replenish the earth. Whatever gets used, make sure it gets restored. You know? And subdue. In other words, have dominion over it. Subject it, which is what authority is for. Right? And have dominion. Again, He says have dominion. Mm, you see, yeah. 
The authority we have is to have dominion on this planet. And who authorized us? The creator of the planet. Mm, yeah. There is no higher authorization than having the creator of the planet say this is the blessing that you are here for. This is the blessing for your life. Is that you can be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. In fact, I command you to do that. <laughs> Yeah, this is the blessing. And you know, we've lived far below the, the blessing level that God has for us because, you know, for many years the church has preached a, a gospel of salvation, come and Jesus will forgive your sin and, uh, you know, and, and cleanse your life and you'll have a home in heaven and, and so on. And that, that's not the gospel of the kingdom. You see, the gospel of the kingdom is about the king and the king's realm, his domain. And what is our role or our destiny in that? It is to have dominion on this planet. Jesus is coming back for a church without spot and wrinkle. What's that going to look like? That's going to be a people who know how to be fruitful and are being fruitful, who are multiplying the things of the kingdom and who are replenishing the earth and who are subduing it and who are ruling over, having dominion. And this, this is the natural world. Do you know, I, I know of a, an apostle in Mexico who... Um, um, there was a lot of criticism in the area of Mexico that his network of churches was in was a remote area. And um, uh, this guy's an American guy, actually. And there was a lot of persecution uh, because uh, a lot of Mexico has a mix between the, um, uh, the demonic culture and, the, and Catholicism mixed together. And so, um, so they are against anything else, you know. And so um, there was a lot of persecution of his churches. Churches were being burned. Pastors were being, you know, beaten up and murdered and stuff like that. And the, the whole area of the country went into drought. And so then there was uh, a lot of accusation that the drought was caused by the Christians. Right? And so in the middle of all this where there's a lot of persecution and accusation that the drought was the fault of the Christians, so we should persecute them more and get rid of them. In the middle of that, he publicly proclaimed that the drought would be broken and that it would rain, but only on the Christian farms. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. The storm clouds came over, the rain started to fall, but it only fell on the farms of Christians. Wow. So their farms are green and the others are brown. <laughs> Their crops are growing and, and maturing and they've got a harvest coming. The others can't grow anything. Wow. See, we have authority over the natural world. Not to do our own thing, but in order to glorify that king, in order to advance the things of the kingdom. Yep. Do you know that situation turned things around? They have a great harvest come in as a result. Not just a natural harvest, but a harvest of souls into the kingdom. And it stopped the persecution because nobody could deny the authority this man had by being able to decree that it would, the drought would be broken, it would rain, but only on the Christians' farms. We had a situation actually this year where we had a lot of rain in our summer, like we did last summer. But fortunately we had no flood this year. But one Sunday morning, I, just, I got up and it was raining, and I really felt like our people were tired of the rain, and people were struggling, you know, and, uh, and, and that, um, that our, the people in our church needed a break. You know, this was Sunday morning, and uh, so I was driving the church van and um, uh, going into the, the, the hall, and, um, and on the way, something began to rise up inside me. And I got to the hall, and it's still raining, and um, I was the first one there. And so I, uh, I stood in the undercover area outside the building, and uh, I looked at the clouds, and I just began to speak to them. And I said, you, go that way. You, go that way. You, go that way. You, go that way. There will be no rain over this place today. <laughs> Do you know, within a few minutes, there was blue sky over this part of the city, these eastern suburbs. And it remained like that till late afternoon. And then the clouds all... And there was rain everywhere else except this part of the city. And our people came to church and you know, to the service and it was like, wow. Isn't this wonderful? We've had rain for days, but look at this. <laughs> we have authority yeah. in the natural world. Yes. We do. Yeah. You know, I read a book years ago about the revival in um, uh, West Papua, I think it was, and, uh, and uh, where they, um, uh, they saw uh, had water turned to wine. 
And they walked across on top of the water on flooded rivers to get to places that they felt God had told them to go to. Wow. Amazing supernatural things. Why? Because we have authority in the natural world. Mm -hmm. Amen? Now I've heard preachers preach, well, you know, Jesus walked on water and whatever, but that just because he did it doesn't mean that we can or whatever. Except from Genesis 1, we're called to subdue the natural world. Yep. Amen. We were given authority mm -hmm. over the natural world. And it's our blessing to have it, as long as it's for the sake of the king. Amen? Yes, amen. All right. So, so then, we also have authority in the spiritual world. In Luke 9, 1 and 2, Jesus called his 12 disciples together. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And what did he do? He gave them power and authority. Now, power is the might or the force or the strength to do things. Authority is the right to be able to do them. So he gave them power and authority. He gave them the right, the authority, the supremacy, if you will, to, 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 um, uh, you know, to go out and minister on his behalf and to minister like he did. And then he actually gave them the power, the force to do it with. All right? And here's the thing. He gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So when he gave them authority, he knew that they would need it in order to actually declare about the kingdom. Because you need the king's authority to, to be able to declare about the kingdom with impact and with effectiveness. But not only that, it's interesting here, they, they were to cure diseases, but they were also to have authority over all devils. Do you know, I think we have, without a kingdom perspective, we have brought this down to uh, casting devils out of people, mostly. Yeah. Yeah, we have. So he sent them out, and they had authority to go out, and if they came across a demon-possessed person, they had the authority and the power to deliver that person. That's not what it says. It says over all devils. So principalities and powers are devils, aren't they? Mm. He gave them authority over all devils. Not just those that might be harassing and binding people, not just those who might be possessing a person's life, but over all devils, which means the principalities and powers as well. This is the kind of authority we have in the spiritual world. We have authority in the natural world, we have authority in the spiritual world. And if all we use our spiritual authority to do is to deliver people from demonic bondage of some sort, then we are actually only exercising our authority in a small way. Because he gave his disciples authority over all devils. And if we're going to change communities and cities and nations, then we have to understand that he's given us authority over the principalities and powers, as well as the smaller demons, if you will, that, that might harass or possess people. Yeah? There's, um, there's been all kinds of stuff taught about this. But the bottom line is, if we understand our authority and know how to walk in partnership with the Holy Spirit, then He will lead us in how to deal with these things. There's no formulas. <laughs> it's true. You know, we planted our church here three years ago. This, this uh, weekend is our third anniversary. And we've had to contend because the, uh, the, the suburb that our church meets in is actually a dead part of the city. It has a history of all, all the way back to when the white settlers came, there was a lot of murders in the area. And so we've had to contend for some stuff, for, for the ground, you know. Um, I knew that the first thing that Judy and I had to do was to be able to buy a house. Now, we were not in a position to buy a house. But that doesn't matter. Because if God is saying this is what's got to happen for you to claim territory here, not only in the natural, but also in the spiritual, then God will make a way, and He did. It took four months, but God made a way, and we bought a house. And we're paying it off to the bank, of course. We don't own it outright. The bank owns more of it than we do. <laughs> but we, we put our feet on the ground, and we claimed some land. Yeah? Now, we know we've got to do the same with the church. Not because we want a big, nice building to try and attract people, but because there is a spiritual principle that is part of the process that God has given us here to be able to exercise our authority in the, in the city. And, and, and uh, so we are looking to buy a building. We have no money for it, but that still doesn't matter because God has a way. <laughs> 
And in the right time, it'll happen. And God will have the right strategy for us. But we are, part of our prayer as a church is, is about getting a property. Why? Because it's going to be part of uh, the exercising of our authority in the spirit realm against the principalities and powers over this part of our city. We need to understand the authority that we have. Amen? Because that was the question they said. By what authority do you do these things? We need to be able to answer that question to ourselves. Mm. What is my authority? Well, I'm authorised to have supremacy over the principalities and powers. Is that easy? No, it's not. Because they've been entrenched for generations. <coughs> for centuries sometimes, you know? But, if God says He's given us dominion, and Jesus said he get, He's given us authority, which He has, then... We need to then say, well, Lord, if you've given us this authority, how do we use it? Amen? What is your purpose? What is your strategy? How do we exercise this authority over the devils? And not just those that inhabit or harass people's lives, but the bigger demonic forces and, and strongholds and so on. Yeah. Okay, so thirdly, with this authority, we don't lord it over people. All right? We have authority over the natural world. We have authority over the spirit world. But we don't, don't lord it over people. Matthew 20, verses 25 to 27. And there are a lot of people who cannot separate this. Yes, we have authority to lead, but we do not lord it over people. So we serve them, we, we bless them, we encourage them, we equip them, we raise them up, we release them, we give them guidelines, we, we correct and rebuke and exhort at times because that's part of what we have to do. But that's not lording it over people. Lording it over people is actually controlling their lives, forcing them to do things, uh, manipulating them, um, telling them what to think, etc., etc. You know, that's lording it over. And there is a difference between lording it over and exercising good leadership, godly authority in leading people. And so, um, and, and as I said, a lot of people can't separate the two. I, re I think it requires a revelation to be able to separate the two things. Because sometimes good leadership to, to some people looks like they're being lorded over. We've had people come to our church and, uh, you know, I've been called all kinds of things. <laughs> There's a few reasons. One is because if people have experienced bad leadership or wrong leadership, then they will be automatically sensitive to things that they might interpret or perceive to be the same thing. But we do have to be strong leaders. But does that mean we're lording it over? No. We're not controlling anybody's minds or lives or anything like that. But we certainly do want to say, this is what the Word of God says. Here's the boundaries. This is the foundation of the Word. These are the values. This is who God's called us to be. This is the character of Christ. This is how we live it. This is who God's calling us to become. And then what happens is people have a choice, but in the kingdom, that choice is, has got to start with lordship. If Jesus is Lord, we surrender to His kingship, and then everything must align with His will and plan and purpose. And our job, particularly at the apostolic grace, is to actually minister in this way so that people will align their lives in surrender to the King. And let their lives then become aligned to His character, to His will, to His plan, His purpose. Amen? Alright. And so here's the thing. Matthew 20, 25 to 27. Now I'm sure you know these verses. Matthew 20, 25 to 27. Jesus called them, uh, called them and said, You know the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and, that they, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. All right, so what he's saying is they exercise dominion, but over them. They put them down. All right? They exercise authority upon them. So it's the actual use of it that is wrong amongst the Gentiles. But he says, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. I was so pleased that, to hear the guy in our church on Sunday say, God spoke to me. It's got to be less of me and more of him. You know why? Because that's exactly how Jesus said it's to be. Uh, we actually say it's not about me, it's about him. It's about his will and his plan, his purposes. And so it's about, it's about us saying, I'm nothing. But he's everything in me and he's everything through me. Amen? Alright, number two. Who gave me this authority? So the first question was, uh, what is the authority? What do authority do I have? We have authority in the natural world, the spiritual world, but not to lord it over people. Alright? It's to lead them, but not lord it over them. 
So who gave him this authority? Well, firstly, God did. The Godhead. Because in Genesis 1, as we saw, verses 26 to 28, he said, This is the blessing. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. You know, fill it, subdue it, have dominion. And, um, and so the Godhead did. And we know that the Godhead was involved in creation. Because the Father spoke. The Holy Spirit created the environment for it to happen. And Jesus was the conduit for the Word. He's the Word that the, that the Father spoke. So all... You know, the, the three, you know, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were involved in creation. And, and, and Genesis 1, we're reading in verse 26 to 28 about creation. So it's let us, the three, of, three parts of the Godhead, let us make man in our image. You see? And so, um, so then um, it's the Godhead that has given us authority. Jesus gave authority to his disciples. Luke chapter 9, 1 and 2 which we looked at before. And he gave them power and authority over all the devils and to cure diseases and to preach the gospel of the kingdom. But then the next chapter, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 to 20. Luke 10, verses 17 to 20. It doesn't say that Jesus gave the 70 authority, but they saw that or would have known that Jesus gave the 12 authority, but he sent them out and gave them instructions as to how to function. That's what he did in Luke 10 for the 70. When they came back, Luke 10, verses 17 to 20, they said, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through your name. So they went out and discovered they had authority. Isn't that amazing? They went out and found it because they followed Jesus' instructions that they had authority which got released and even the devils were subject to them in his name. So we don't have to know all about it. We've simply got to be obedient. If we're obedient to the Holy Spirit, we'll discover we have authority. If we're obedient to the Holy Spirit, we'll see kingdom outcomes as we function the way He's leading us to function. Because we'll be then functioning in the authority that He's given us, you know? And so therefore, we'll see that the devils are subject to us in His name. And other supernatural things will happen as well. So here's Jesus' response when they come back all excited about the fact that they discovered that they had authority and saw the outworking of it. He said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. So I give you power to tread on, and the word power there actually is the word for authority. It's exousia. All right, so it's interesting in English how they mix things around sometimes in the English translations, but it's actually exousia. So they're saying, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Wow. That's incredible, eh? Nothing shall by any means hurt you. There is a place of dominion that we are yet to enter into where nothing hurts us. That's a big statement, isn't it? <laughs> All right. We haven't entered into that yet, but I think it's firstly because we've been living with a mindset that's not kingdom oriented. Mm. You know, we've had all kinds of preconceptions built into our minds that need to be dismantled mm. and our thinking reprogrammed. Um, but also we haven't understood our authority. We haven't understood what it means that you know to exercise dominion. We haven't understood that this is our destiny. It's actually the blessing upon mankind is to have dominion and to exercise and to live in dominion where nothing hurts us. Does this mean no, no bad thing will happen? No, it doesn't. What it means is whether bad things or good things are going on, nothing touches us, nothing hurts us. That's dominion. And then he said, notwithstanding in this, don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Is he just talking about, oh, hang on until Jesus comes and takes us back and saves us from this planet? No. He's talking about a hope for the future, but also he's talking about the, the foundational things, the, the things that anchor us. He was saying, don't get so excited about seeing devils cast out or whatever, that you drift away from the central things, from the things that will anchor you in the things of the kingdom. You know, and I've got to say, since the 80s, we've had, we've had so much that has taken people all different directions, you know. Uh, people chase after prophecies, and they chase after preachers, and they, they chase this fad and this ideology, and this, you know, and people are chasing all kinds of stuff, and they've forgotten about the fact that there are some central things that are foundational that we cannot ever go away from. And they're more important than chasing the exciting stuff. Mm, yeah. That's what Jesus was saying. But if we have authority, then we understand that. That we don't just chase all kinds of exciting things, 
but we have authority for a purpose. And, and, and we know our authority and we know who's given it to us, so therefore we are careful to actually live our lives and minister on his behalf and not to assume how he wants us to, to exercise his authority, but to actually ask him. Yeah, that's a thought. See, there's been a lot of assumptions about spiritual authority. And people have run off and said, oh, I've, I've got a revelation about my authority as a believer and about my authority as a son of the king. And, you know, and what we do is we take that revelation and use it for our own gain. And I'm talking about extremes here, which, as you know, after a week with me, uh, that um, this is what I do because it helps us to separate things and get clarity in our thinking. But, you know, a lot of people have run off with the authority that they, and the revelation of it and just used it to produce what they wanted to produce instead of actually humbling themselves and saying, Oh, Lord, my King, you've authorized me, but now what do you want me to do with that? How do you want me to use this? Yeah. Because when we get to heaven, there's some people he's going to say, sorry, I didn't know you. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, you cast out devils, but you just took my authority that I gave you and went off and did your own thing. You know? I don't want to be one of them. <laughs> This is why, for me, it's so important that we walk humbly before God. And, you know, we talk about being ambassadors of the King and representing Him. When I was in, in high school, I was in a Christian group called, called Christ's Ambassadors. What a wonderful name that is. Except we didn't have a clue what it meant, really. I'm so glad now I've got a bit more understanding what it means to be an ambassador of the King, you know. But here's the thing. If we're going to represent Him, we need to ask Him how He wants us to represent Him. Not just assume and not take his authority and his power and his grace and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and just run off with assumptions. But we need to be asking him every day, saying, Holy Spirit, lead me. Mm -hmm. oh, Lord my King, what, what do you want from me? How, what are you asking of, for, of me? How do you want me to function? How do you want me to respond in this situation? How do you want me to deal with this situation? And you know, as we do that, then people are going to not only see the authority on us, but they will also come to know who gave us the authority because we will be accurately representing the one who's given us the authority. Amen? All right. So number three is how do we exercise this authority? How do we exercise it? Gee, Emmanuel, I think, um, you know, you're only going to have about five minutes to speak today. I'm going to roll here. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to what you're going to pour on us today, my brother. It's wonderful that, you, that you're coming, that you're here. And, uh, yeah. All right, how do we exercise this authority? Firstly, we've got to exercise dominion over ourselves. That's where it starts. Ruth and I had a, had a very brief conversation about this on Sunday. Oh, you mean our kingdom? The clash of the kingdoms. Oh, yeah. It starts in here. <laughs> the kingdom of self and the kingdom of the spirit, you know. The, the flesh wars against the spirit, all right. Where do we have to firstly learn to exercise the authority the king gives us, it's to have dominion over our own selves. Um, Proverbs 16.32 is one of my favourite verses. I don't know if you're allowed to have favourite verses. Uh, if it's wrong, I'm sorry, but this is one of my favourite verses. <laughs> it says this, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, but here's the part that I love. And he that ruleth his spirit... It's greater than he that take the city. The one who can, who's got dominion over himself is actually greater than an army that overthrows a city. That is incredible, hey? The power of self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit, you know? The, the, um, uh, the, the incredible power of uh, actually um, exercising the authority Jesus has given us in the kingdom in our own lives, in our own minds, to, to bring our thoughts under subjection, to make, keep our hearts right. Why? Because out of the heart flows the issues of life. If we don't exercise dominion over our own hearts, then all kinds of issues are going to flow out of our hearts. If we don't exercise dominion over our own minds, and if we don't keep our minds and our hearts in subjection to the King, then all kinds of things are going to go on in our lives and relationships. But you know, the exercising of the authority the King gives us starts right here. <laughs> and here. Yeah. I'll use both, right? Here. <laughs> yeah. 
Because, you know why? Because if we are going to have dominion on this planet, we've got to be, have, be able to have dominion over our own spirit. That's what it says. If we want to be powerful in the things of God, you know, it's not about having men's credentials. It's about actually understanding the authority we've been given as kings and people. And understanding who it is that's given it to us. And starting here, you know, with ourselves. And uh, because then we will actually be mightier, stronger, more powerful, better, more effective than an army that can take a city. Isn't that powerful? I want to tell you something, that gives me hope. <laughs> and also, you know, it means that, that um, the things that uh, you know, we see in the Word of God, one day are going to come to pass. One day we are going to rule in every sphere on the planet. Mm. Kingdom people are going to rule. Not necessarily be the presidents and all that, or not necessarily you know, head up the big organi you know, global organisations. I'm not talking about that kind of dominion theology that's out there. I'm talking about a dominion that means that we are salt and light. Because Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Other kinds of people might run things, but we are going to have something that will prevail. Because dominion is influence. It's not control over people, it's influence. All right, secondly, how do we exercise authority? We've got to go in Jesus' authority. We know this from Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus came and spoke to them and said, All authority is given to me, in heaven and on earth. All authority. Here's the thing, and I've said this often over the last few years, so some of you may have heard me say this. If Jesus has been given all authority by the Father, there's no other authority. Because all is all. <laughs> True? So if Jesus has all authority, guess what? The devil has none. Amen. True? And the authority of man is irrelevant. I don't mean in the sense of being disobedient to the laws of the land or whatever. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm talking about authorities in the spiritual sense. Alright? Yeah. So all authority has been given to Jesus in heaven and earth. The devil doesn't have any of it. And we don't have any of it. No, nobody had no, no man or woman has any of it unless Jesus gives it to them. Yeah. What an awesome privilege that is. That's why the word for authority in the New Testament includes the concept of privilege. It is such a privilege to be authorized by our king, and it's not, not for us to create privileges for ourselves. It is then such a privilege to uh, represent him and to exercise that authority on his behalf so that his will and plans and purposes can be accomplished. See, the authority, spiritual authority in the kingdom is an incredible privilege because the only one who has all authority is our king and he chooses to give to us in order to fulfill his purposes. All right, so we go in his authority. Thirdly, authority is about executing judgment. Executing judgment, that's the concept. And it says it of Jesus in John 5, 27. He has given him authority to execute judgment. But that's the concept of spiritual authority. Now this is not to judge people and condemn them. Right? So when we're talking about exercising judgment, we're not talking about, you know, when Jesus said, Judge not lest you be judged. And he said, with the measure you judge, you'll be judged. All right, so we're not talking about that kind of judgment, which is a, to judge people from a, a, um, a prejudice and condemn them because they're different or something. You know? And I'm not talking about racial prejudice. I'm talking about there can be a, a, a religious prejudice, a um, super spiritual prejudice, a self-righteous prejudice you know, from which we judge people. And we're not to do that, Jesus said. So we're not talking about that kind of judgment. We're talking about uh, a judgment that comes from discernment, a judgment that comes from uh, prophetic insight, a judgment that comes from knowing the, the ways of the kingdom and knowing the, 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 um, the plans that the king has and what his will is and what he wants to accomplish. And so therefore we execute that judgment against the enemies of the king. That's what authority is. So when we, if we're going to exercise our spiritual authority, it is to... Um, it is to actually execute judgment against the enemies of the king and his kingdom and to then 
bring to bear that authority in order to subdue and to subject the enemies of the kingdom. Which is why Jesus said, I give you authority over all devils, which includes principalities and powers. Now we have to be very careful that we don't just run off and start taking authority over principalities and powers, because we, firstly we're going to be led by the Spirit. Absolutely. Secondly, if you're going to do it on your own, you'll probably get killed. Because the Bible's not, you know, and the New Testament church and the kingdom of God is not about lone rangers. It's about team, you know. And um, here we, we actually have uh, had all kinds of situations, and, and, um, but, but, and particularly those of us in leadership here have had battle after battle after battle. Why? Because we have established ourselves in a place where there's been principalities and powers that have ruled for generations, probably for centuries. And there's, there's a handful of other churches in our area, but none of them are doing anything you know, great for the kingdom. Most of them are just religious centers, you know. And God's called us to come and establish an apostolic center to be an expression of the kingdom of God in this dead part of the city where there's, there's no other churches that are doing what, we're, what God's called us here to do. So we, we've got a battle on our hands. Well, we've got, a, we've got a war on our hands and a series of battles in that war. And, and our leaders have been the ones who have, who have caught the brunt of it. Do you know, in the second half of last year, my wife and I had to deal with five deaths. One was her mother, another was a very dear brother-in-law um, of ours, and there were three others as well, family members and so on. I've got to tell you something, you know, when you're, when, when you're deal, trying to deal with that, that, that's kind of, it just keeps coming at you, you know? But the fact is, we understand that God's authorized us here, and He's authorized us to be fruitful here, and to multiply, and to fill this place, and replenish it, and to subdue it, and to have dominion. And all kinds of things can happen, but we will prevail because in the kingdom we have a prevailing spirit within us. That's what this authority I'm talking about gives us. It gives us an ability to prevail. That's why Jesus said none of these things will hurt you. Why? Because cream always rises to the top and not in a prideful sense or in the world sense. The fact is that we have a blessing from God from Genesis 1, which means that we, no matter what happens, it can't hurt us. We have dominion. You know, um, two and a bit years ago, um, there's, a, there's a series of CDs that will be available at the conference called The Primary DNA of the Kingdom. And um, I, I be, started preaching in the beginning of February 2010. And um, I was, um, I had a, about five months, another series that was going to go for about five months, all prepared, ready to go, all the outlines, everything. And um, I preached that um, last year. Um, but I was all ready to go with this and God just spoke to me really clearly and redirected me and gave me four messages about the primary DNA of the kingdom, which is a prevailing spirit. I preached the first out of the four and then in the middle of the week after that, my 18-year-old uh, nephew was killed in a car accident. You know, when I got the phone call, it was like, it was like all the air was sucked out of my body. And uh, I had to, I was in the kitchen actually, and, and I had to, I, I sort of half collapsed on the sink because I was, you know, almost fell to the floor. That was the impact on, my, on me, you know. Uh, he, he was uh, just such a, just a beautiful young man, you know. And, um, um, and so then we, you know, and he and his mum lived an hour and a half drive away from here, so we had, you know, Judy and I had to get some things together, get in the car, we had to go pick up my parents, you know, who, who, are, who are old now, they're in their 80s, and drive up. An hour and a half, and of course, you know, my sister, who's, who, who was his mother, was just an absolute mess. Judy and I had to go at midnight that night to the to the morgue and identify his body, which is not a pleasant experience when it, you know killed in a car accident, head injuries, and so on. Um, you know, and, and then my sister asked me to do the funeral. How do you do a funeral like that? You know, so I, I preached the first in this series of messages, and all all hell breaks loose that week. And in the middle of it all, God said to me, you are going to model a prevailing spirit to your church. Now, that, that's pretty heavy. I was like, man, I don't feel like modeling anything. I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. Now, I know you're, you're all too spiritual and that would never happen with you. <laughs> but it's amazing 
how in the kingdom things are so different. All of a sudden I, I realized God had actually redirected me with my preaching and got me into the word to you know, given me these four messages about having a prevailing spirit, which is the prevailing, uh, which is the primary DNA of the kingdom of God. All right, and God, because God knew what was going to happen. So, firstly, He prepared me, but then He also did something that meant that we actually had dominion over ourselves and over the situation. And even though it was very difficult, I want to tell you, it revolutionized our church. It really did. Because they saw what the kingdom's about. Do you know this authority we have means that things don't touch us no matter how bad they are. It means that we dominate them. That's what dominion means. We dominate. Now we don't dominate people. Unfortunately, you know, that's been done at top, you know, too much in the, in the church. We don't dominate people, but we dominate spiritual forces. We dominate ourselves. You know, our own thinking and feelings and, and, and hard attitudes and whatever. And we, we dominate our circumstances and situations. Amen? That's what we're called to be. And that's what this, this, um, this uh, authority that's been given to us uh, is for. Is to execute judgment. So I had to make a judgment and execute. And the judgment I had to make was, okay, I'm in a very tough situation. But I have a prevailing spirit within me. And so I am going to provide. I am going to exercise the authority that God's given me. And in His power, His authority, I'm going to dominate this thing. It's not going to kill me. It's not going to drive me down. Yeah? See, that's the power and the authority we have. It, I want to tell you something. It, it makes us like super people once we get the revelation on. Because then nothing touches us. And we're on the front line, we're, we're, we're doing battle against spiritual forces and dealing with all kinds of, of things and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and circumstances come and unexpected things happen. But there's something inside us, once we get a revelation of this, that something inside us that rises up and says, I'm not born to come under this, I'm born to rise above it. And it's not the, the natural man's thing of a positive mental attitude. Or it's an understanding of the authority that he's given us and how to exercise it and to make the right judgments in every situation and circumstance of life and ministry. Amen? You know, we had a, a major attack on our leadership in the last few, well, not the last few months, but for a few months at the end of last year and early this year. And, um, you know, some of the things that were said were just bizarre. But it was wonderful to see my team just kind of say, well, no, that, those things aren't true. This is, this is just the enemy trying to, you know, trying to um, you know, strike the sheep and scatter the sheep. Sorry, strike the sheep and scatter the sheep, you know? And, um, you know, and again, this, this thing about, well, God's authorized us to be here and to do this. So then what these couple of people think and are saying and accusing and whatever, no, that's not right because we're actually doing what God's authorized us to do. Yeah. And it's, all of a sudden it's different. You're not, uh, you don't come under the accusations. You don't take things personally. You, don't, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's difficult to work through. It's difficult to process. difficult to have conversations at times with people where, when there's all kinds of crazy accusations. But there's something inside us when we understand our authority that means we execute right judgment. In other words, our perception is different. So therefore, the decisions we make are different. The conclusions we reach are different. Because of the authority God's given us. Amen? Amen. Alright. The last one. We're to dismantle the structures of the evil one. That's what this authority is for. To dismantle the structures of the evil one. You know, it says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest, to destroy the works of the, of the devil. Alright? In 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10, 1-6. And I spoke about this the other day. Where Paul says, um, I beseech, oh sorry, he says, um, the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What for to bring to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You see, again, it's talking about ex executing judgment. That the thing that stops us from being able to function in the authority He's given us. And that even stops some people from having a revelation of it and, and understanding what it is and, and uh, 
and, and how, how do we exercise it is um, the fact that there are strongholds in our minds. And there's, there's the strongholds of wrong thinking in our world as well. And the, this authority that's been given, because 2 Corinthians 10, Paul's talking about his apostolic authority. So this authority, the purpose of it is for us to, to um, speak the message of the kingdom and to actually pull down the strongholds of thinking. Because that's what it comes down to. Every thought is what it's talking about. Every thought. And so it's how people think. It's the thought processes, the perspectives that people have. You know, we have universities that are filled with all kinds of thinking and, and, and uh, you know, thought processes and perspectives. A lot of universities in our world, particularly in, in, in the UK and in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the US, started out as Christian colleges of learning, as Bible schools. And yet they've, they've got strongholds of all kinds of thinking in them now. Isn't that true? And, and, and you would not say those places have, have a Christian basis to them any longer. But God wants the kingdom to be restored so that we understand our authority, so that we can actually have influence that will reverse those things. That will actually uh, confront the ideologies that are opposite to the kingdom. So that, so that there are people in the world who have this prevailing spirit in them and know their authority and know how to actually speak to issues and influence people, and issue, influence people of influence. So that ultimately the strongholds are pulled down, the arguments, the reasonings, the rationales begin to be dismantled, and the things that rise up in people against the kingdom purposes begin to be cast down, and eventually their thinking processes are completely turned around so that they actually are come, come into submission to, the, to, the, to Christ the King. Amen? And then we, there's, we, can, we can actually execute judgment with our authority. Why? Because it says we can take revenge on all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled. In other words, when our uh, when, when people's um, when the authority God's given us actually pulls down on the strongholds and changes their thinking so that they understand the things of the kingdom, then what happens is that they then come into a place where they can ex execute judgment with that authority on other things that are disobedient to the Lordship of Christ. Yeah. Amen? If we are going to multiply the things of the kingdom, we've got to understand the authority the king's given us. And it's about having dominion. We're, Dominion of, ourself, of our own lives. Dominion in our own thoughts and, and heart and so on. And then understanding who has given us this authority and that the executing of it is to uh, pull down the structures of the enemy. And of course, finally, in Matthew 16, verses 15 to 19, Matthew 16, 15 to 19, Jesus said, I'll build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail. In other words, we are those who prevail against the rulership of hell. Uh, and... He says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. And, and what's that? Keys of authority. They represent authority. And he said, with those keys, you're going to bind the things that you know are being bound in heaven. And you're going to loose the things that you know are being loosed in heaven. This is how we exercise our authority. And this is why we need to understand, as I talked last week about the Holy Spirit being the governor of the kingdom. And, and us submitting to him and partnering with him and, and learning how to walk with him and and be led by him so that he will lead us in how to exercise the authority, what to bind, what to lose, and fulfill kingdom purposes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's stand up, right?